So hi, welcome everyone. My name is Krista Norwick and I am running this hiking webinar for you. So I put this webinar together really in response to my experience hiking and meeting so many different people of different abilities, ages, um, skill levels, all kind of having similar issues while hiking, which is battling kind of ongoing injuries, getting sidelined by injuries, not feeling like their body is prepared in order to hike. And I really wanted to put together this webinar in order to help educate people early, well before hiking season, how to actually prepare your body for hiking and how to prevent those injuries before they happen. So I'm putting on this webinar um, through my company, Karen Physiotherapy. So I am a physiotherapist, but just as a disclaimer, because this is a webinar where I'm not doing an assessment individually with you, I can't give you physiotherapy assessment, treatment, or advice, but what I'm providing you with is physiotherapy education from my expertise as a physiotherapist. So a little bit more about me. My name, as I said, is Krista, and I have my master's in physical therapy from UBC. I founded Karen Physiotherapy last year, and really that was in response to starting to train for my first big through hike called the Great Divide Trail, which is a 950 kilometer through hike through the Rocky Mountains of Canada. And I started asking my colleagues and asking around to find someone who understood what I was asking of my body by hiking that long with a backpack. And I actually had a really hard time finding anyone. Um, and I realized that this service isn't really available for people. And so I decided to create it. So I wanted to create an online service that can help people of all different ages and abilities and um, just be outside and, and live their most meaningful lives. So I am also an outdoor vlogger and blogger. Uh, you may have seen my vlogs from the Great Divide Trail, and that's through my, I co-own um, MillennialMountaineer.com with my husband. And I love to hike, backpack, backcountry ski, cross-country ski, and now I'm a thru-hiker now that I've done the Great Divide Trail this past summer. So just to give you a little bit more of an idea of why I'm offering this through care and physiotherapy, really it's my mission to offer high quality physiotherapy services to as many people as possible. So increasing accessibility by making those services online and being able to treat people and then also educate people all across the world and be able to share that knowledge. And really the whole reason for that is to really empower you to make informed decisions about your health live a more fulfilled life, prevent injuries before they happen, and spend more time outdoors in whatever capacity you like to do that. So this is really part of our education mandate is offering free webinars. And this is just the first of many. I think everyone here has seen a physiotherapist, um, but just to give you a brief overview, so physiotherapists are body movement specialists. So we understand how the muscles attach to the bones through tendons and move the bones, move your joints and stabilize your joints. So really that movement and exercise activity. There are other areas of practice for physiotherapy like heart and lung health and neurological health and inner ear and lots of different things. Um, but I'm focusing primarily on our area of practice called musculoskeletal with this talk. So muscles, bones, joints, ligaments, not to say that other Areas of your body don't impact your ability to hike, but that's where I'm really drawing my expertise from is that musculoskeletal. So we'll talk about injury prevention, injury recovery, overall wellness, and disease management. If you're at this webinar, you probably feel most alive when you're outside and perhaps when you're hiking. So I really want to try to create more opportunities for you to go where you feel most alive by feeling confident in your body. So we'll dive deeper into a few different topics in this chat today. So I'm going to talk about common hiking injuries, risk factors that can lead to those injuries, how to prevent those injuries, a little bit on what to do if you sustain an injury, and then bringing all that and putting it together into how do you prepare your body for hiking and increase your performance. And I'll answer questions at the end as well as I'll, and I'll tr probably try to pause throughout to answer if there's any questions. 
Okay, so let's dive into it. So hiking injuries occur in two major ways. The first way is through high impact injuries. So that's if you slip, fall, trip, and you can roll your ankle, break a bone, um, injure yourself in more of a sudden way. Usually those injuries, you can pinpoint exactly when you injured yourself. Like You know, that's when I sprained my ankle. That's when I broke my bone. The second category is overuse injuries. So overuse injuries are usually ones that you can't really pinpoint when you hurt yourself. You just started to notice some area in your body started to give you trouble, whether it be pain or stiffness or impairment. And that's because you put repetitive stress through your body over and over and over and over. And that can manifest as joint pain and injuries, muscle tendon injuries, paresthesias, that's nerve-related injury or discomfort, and skin injuries. And there are many reasons why an overuse injury might happen, and we'll dive into that um, with risk factors. So when I checked out, when I was trying to find the incidences of injury, I actually found a great study done by the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit. And what they found is that 90% of hiking and mountaineering injuries affect the lower extremities. So that's basically from your pelvis down to your feet. And 50% of those included sprains and strains of the ankles, knees, and back. So ankles, knees, and back are the most common joints to injure with hiking. And people reported these as falls, slips, and overuse injuries. And hiking injury rates I found also quantified in this study, and they based it on 1,000 participant days. So for mountaineering, 6.1 out of 1,000 days, people report an injury. Backpacking, it's 4.7 of those days. Day hiking, it's two. So you can see as the terrain gets more technical, the injury rates go up. And hiking actually was ranked as the sixth highest injury rate out of about 40 sports in a study done in Denmark. So quite high injury rates for hiking. So let's dive deeper into exactly what injuries can happen. So with long distance hiking, I found this study done on the Pacific Crest Trail. So the Pacific Crest Trail, if you don't know it, is a really long through hike. I can't remember exactly how long right now. I think it's a couple thousand kilometers from the border of the U.S. and Mexico to the border of U.S. and Canada. And it goes up through the the mountains, the Sierra Nevadas, and up to the border. So this study pulled hikers, and the hikers had to have hiked at least 800 kilometers. So on the left-hand side here, you'll see musculoskeletal and nerve injuries broken down in this pie chart. What you'll notice is that the most common injury type reported was paresthesias at 34.5%. So that's that nerve-related injury or pain. So that's numbness, tingling, burning sensation of the hands, legs, or feet. And then the second most was joint pain. So joint pain was at 27.6%. And we can probably guess that that's most likely ankles, knees, and backs because those are the three most common joints um, reported in the previous study. Joint sprains and shin splints were both at 13.8%. And it's interesting to note that I didn't find any data on shin splints in shorter distance hikes. (coughs) Excuse me. Shorter distance hikes. Um, So this is really something that happens more with the long distance hiking. Only 4% reported broken bones. Six people reported broken bones. Four was from a high, no, sorry, two were from high impact injuries where they fell and broke their bone. Four were repetitive strain injuries. So just repetitively putting pressure through that bone, which creates a stress fracture. So it's a really, really tiny fracture in the bone itself. And all of the people who reported stress fractures, interestingly, were wearing sandals for their hike. And then muscle strains and sprains were really low and tendon and ligament injuries were low. On the right hand side, I broke down the skin injuries and mostly I did this because I have met a lot of people who either aren't enjoying their hike because of blisters or actually had to leave trail and stop hiking because of their blisters. And 61% of long distance hikers have blisters at some point. When I looked for shorter hikes and day hiking data, I couldn't actually find that much information in the research. So it's an under-researched area still. 
But what I was able to find was that muscle strains and sprains were at a much higher incidence than long distance hiking at 30%. But most of the injuries presented were scrapes, cuts, and blisters. Now, of course, there's no data that I could find on broken bones or more serious injury, nerve pain, sprained ankles, but in my experience hiking and meeting people on the trail and working as a physiotherapist, I definitely see those injuries with day hikers, but again, I just don't know what the incidence is. Now that we know what injuries are common, how can they be prevented? So the great news is is we can prevent injuries and we can help prevent re-injuries. So... How do we do that? There are identifiable risk factors that increase your specific risk of injury. So the first thing we need to do is identify those risk factors. The second thing we need to do is address them. And then the third thing is to have an ongoing maintenance plan to keep your risk factors at bay. So keep them as low as possible to keep your injury risk low. And we're talking about injuries in this section, but this also is linked into you're preparing your body for hiking by addressing your risk factors, because that makes your body more able to achieve your goal and more able to do it well without having setbacks. So let's dive into them. There are two different types of risk factors. One is intrinsic, so internal to your body. The second one is extrinsic, so external to your body, anything outside your body. The first internal risk factor I'm going to talk about is physical. So physical risk factors, and I'm going to speak from the musculoskeletal side of things as a physiotherapist. Now, there are, um, in the point here of overall health, there are other things that definitely impact your risk of injury. Like if you have blood pressure issues or dizziness or vertigo or neurological issues, anything um, that could potentially impact your ability to move your body on the hiking trail. That can impact it. I'm not speaking specifically about those because it's um, not the focus of today's talk, but that is something to keep in mind. And having an overall, having a better fitness level does help you decrease your risk of injury. Now, from the musculoskeletal side of things, muscular imbalances are huge for injury prevention and addressing um, your risk factors for injury. So muscle imbalance means that at a specific joint in your body. So let's take your hip, for example. You have muscles that counteract each other's forces. So you have muscles on the front of your hip that um, create one direction of movement and at the back of your hip that create the other. And what happens is sometimes those muscles on the front and the back have an imbalance. So one is working harder than the other. So in the instance of the hip, if the front muscles are working harder than the back muscles, which are your glute muscles that form your buttock, what happens is that makes you more likely to experience a hip injury, knee injury, even ankle and foot injury, and lower back injury higher up from there. You can also um, experience muscular injuries like muscle strains or sprains because one muscle is overworking and the other muscle is underworking. Another thing is habitual movement patterns. So if we're still thinking about the hip, um, if at that joint you actually have great muscular balance and good muscle strength, But just by habit, you don't quite use it properly or in the most ideal way. And so you go out and you use your quads, which are the front of your thigh, more than your glutes. And that's going to increase your chance of injury again. And a really big one is doing too much too fast. So just a little bit on tissue principles. So the tissues in your body, muscles, bones, joints, ligaments, tendons, they all need slow, progressive load put on them in order to strengthen for an activity. So for example, if I were to start doing bicep curls, and I've never really done one before, um, and I wanted to start today, but my goal was to be able to curl 100 pounds. If I started today and just grabbed a 100 pound weight and tried to do a few bicep curls, my bicep is not ready for that. It hasn't had a chance to adapt to that. And it's really vulnerable to strain, sprain, or even tearing under that increased um, weight that it's trying to pull. But if I started with two pounds today and did a bunch of reps and then took a day off and then did, you know, maybe three pounds and slowly, slowly increased my weight, 
that's stimulating to the bicep muscle and the tendons that they need to start actually increasing their ability to lift weight. So the cells will actually start to remodel themselves. They'll start to build more strength and more force and more structural ability to hold against a weight or a load is what we call it. And then slowly over time, they'll build up that ability. And then when I finally do try that 100 pound weight, it'll be no issue for my muscles and I'll have a way lower risk of injuring myself with that specific activity. And the same thing goes for hiking. The same thing goes for backpacking. If you start off really quick, really far, you carry the heaviest pack, but you haven't done any training with it, that's dramatically increasing your risk of injuring yourself versus if you had slowly, progressively worked your way up to it. And I'll talk a little bit more about details of how to do that quicker later. And then your other internal risk factors are mental. So having too much stoke, so just being so excited to get out there, climb the mountain, summit it, that is a really big indicator of risk because you might do too much too fast for your body or do more than you're actually able to do for your skill level. And then mental fatigue is a big one. So if you're mentally fatigued, maybe from root finding all day or even just, you know, choosing your footing, that's a huge factor. We often think about physical fatigue, but mental fatigue is just as important. And then an ego. So I looked at that study that was done in the Rocky Mountain or sorry, the BC Injury Prevention Unit. And there was a study on search and rescue calls and for climbing accidents, 100% of the callers identified themselves as experts, and 89% of the hiking and scrambling accidents had experts um, who called. So I think it's interesting to know that that experts are usually involved in search and rescue calls. And, you know, there's probably multiple factors at play there, like experts tend to do more high-consequence terrain. But I just think it's important to note if you're an expert to kind of always have that as your process to maybe check your ego or if you're a beginner, um, keeping this in mind and trying to ensure that there is room for a conversation about um, terrain and how comfortable you might feel. And then confidence is a big one. So having overconfidence can be um, can increase your risk of injury because you might do more than you're able to or having underconfidence could. So maybe you're going Um, extra slow, you're being extra cautious, and that could mean that you're more likely to fall. Or maybe you don't make it to camp before sunset and now you're hiking in the dark because you're being a bit overly cautious. And then a really big one is the mental health piece. So if we've all hiked before, we know just how incredible it is for your mental health to be out there, to be in nature, to be exercising. And For so many of us, if we have a little ache, a little pain, it doesn't seem worth taking time off because you don't want your mental health to suffer. And then the external, extrinsic risk factors are terrain. So where people are more likely to injure themselves is scree and downhill terrain. Weather, so unfavorable weather can definitely impact your injury risk. Pack weight can change, so how heavy your pack is can change what injuries you're at higher risk for. Other people, so whether that be people you're with or people that you're not with, maybe kicking loose rocks down and they could come in and hit you if you're below them. And then your equipment also makes a difference. So your fit makes a difference, maintenance, and hiking poles. And we'll dive into that deeper in a few slides. So let's take a closer look at some of these high incidence injuries. So the musculoskeletal system, the muscles, bones, joints, ligaments of the body, that is, I dove into this a little bit further. So what I found was that the research, this research study that was done in the Canadian Rockies found that there were no differences in these injury rates for age or gender, which is great. What they did find with that, or sorry, and they also found there was no differences in pack weight or footwear, which was also really interesting. What does impact musculoskeletal injuries is internal factors, like if you have poor balance, you're more likely to fall or you're more likely to get a repetitive strain injury. Inadequate core strength means you're more likely to get a repetitive strain injury and again, fall. Hiking technique impacts injury rates. 
glute activation, so that's that buttock muscle I was talking about earlier, being able to activate your glutes decreases your risk of injury. And then ankle mobility, so having a flexible enough ankle is important. And then extrinsic, weather does impact these injuries. And again, terrain, the scree and downhill terrain is where these injuries happen the most. The only type of injury, which is ankle sprain, that I could find that had age associated was um, this one. So ankle sprain. So they found that people who are older age were more likely to sprain their ankle and people who are overweight. Past history of ankle sprains was also a big risk factor. Although as a physiotherapist, I, I know that if you rehabilitate a joint fully with working with a physiotherapist, then you can actually dramatically decrease your risk of re-injury. And then long-term lower limb injury. So say you just have like a long-term sore knee or a long-term sore hip, that can really increase your risk of injuring something else in your lower limb or sorry, your ankles, your ankles. And then extrinsically, the, the study also found that scree and downhill slope was where people tended to roll their ankles the most and having inadequately sized or tight shoes. And then interestingly, people who used hiking poles were more likely to sprain their ankle. Okay, and then looking at paresthesias, so we saw that the most common injury in longer distance hikes is paresthesias, so burning, tingling, or numbness in the arms, legs, and feet. And what they found was that this was impacted again by some internal factors like balance, core strength, muscular imbalances. And then the only two external factors they found that impacted this was base pack weight and footwear. And they looked at a bunch and none of the other ones actually impacted it. So to break this down further, on the left hand side, you can see the pack weight graph. So for a base pack weight of 10 to 20 pounds, 27% of hikers reported paresthesia. And then for 21 to 30 pounds, that was 50%. And for over 31 pounds, that was 73%. So big increases as we go. And sorry, if you're not sure what base pack weight is, that's your pack weight with your gear before adding food or water. And then on the right-hand graph, we're looking at footwear. And so interestingly, Hikers wearing hiking boots had a 73% incidence of paras paresthesia. Hiking shoes, it dropped down to 40%. Running shoes to 30%. And sandals all the way down to 25%. So the more sturdy and supportive the footwear, the more likely the hikers were to have paresthesia. So to summarize pack weight, because I think this is a really big topic, based on the research... Pack weight does impact your risk of developing paresthesia, burning, tingling, numbness in the arms, legs, or feet. But pack weight was not found to impact your risk of developing a muscle or joint sprain or strain or a ligament injury. So that's really interesting. And then as a physiotherapist, and then also with the knowledge I already gave you, you know that your body does best when it slowly has time to adapt to a new load placed on it. So we don't have information from this research about what the hikers did to prepare for their hike, but understanding the principles of loading your tissue slowly, these hikers that had paresthesia may have actually had better outcomes if they had have slowly progressively added their pack weight over months and got their body used to it. Now, I wanted to talk about blisters too. So this study was done on hikers of the Camino de Santiago in Spain, and it, it looked at blisters and why they happened. So the most common location is on the fifth toe, and they looked at internal factors like foot posture, and so that's just how your foot looks when you're standing. That didn't impact blister rates. What did impact blisters was higher number of kilometers on asphalt and wet socks at the end of the day. This picture of me is on the Great Divide Trail. This is me standing on the trail, and the trail looked like this for five days. So obviously you can't always have dry socks, but trying, I tried to make sure I changed my socks as much as possible. So we'll talk about addressing these risk factors. So we'll talk about how to address your physical risk factors, mental risk factors, how to select terrain, itinerary planning, and equipment selection. So for your physical risk factors, this is very individual. So 
my muscular imbalances or movement patterns are definitely going to be different than yours. Everyone has a different history with their health too. So you may have a history of shoulder injury or you may have a history of ankle injury and that's going to impact what risk factors you need to address. So your absolute the best thing that you can do um, to address your physical risk factors is to work with a professional. So physiotherapists are experts at identifying your risk factors and then designing a treatment and exercise program to address those risk factors. And they can help you design a training program, especially if they have expertise in it. So if you know, if you're planning for a longer distance hike, it'd be great to find someone like myself who understands long distance hiking. Now, in general, and again, this is general considerations because everyone is so individual. I can't give you, you know, exact exercises that you should do because I'm not doing an assessment with you. I don't know what's going to actually address your issue or what's going to be safe for you. But I can bring up the general considerations. So based on the risk factors that we saw, we know that having strong enough core muscles is really important to prevent injury and to prevent falls. Making sure you have good overall fitness, again, super helpful. So getting outside, moving your body outside in a way that works for you right now, whether it be, you know, cross-country skiing or snowshoeing or something in your area that you enjoy doing. And if you have a history of previous injury, then trying to make sure that you address that injury now early. So what we know about injuries is that they don't have to reoccur. You do have a higher risk of re-injuring yourself if you've injured yourself before, but that risk goes down substantially if you work with a professional to help you address any underlying weaknesses, any underlying movement patterns that aren't serving you anymore, and really strengthen that up, that can dramatically prevent re-injury. We also know that balance is important. Um, adults typically lose their balance because they don't practice it. So practicing balance, you can see in this picture I'm doing um, one-legged balance. Um, practicing your balance and getting good at it is really important for preventing falls and high-impact injuries and also repetitive strain injuries. Proprioception is also a big one. So if you don't know proprioception, proprioception is your ability to know where your body is in space. So if you close your eyes right now and you lift your arm above your head, you should be able to feel where your arm is in space without looking at it. You know your arms above your head. That's proprioception. So that's really important for things like hiking because if you're looking ahead at the terrain, you want to be able to feel where your feet are in space. You want to be able to feel if your foot starts to roll a little bit and not put your full body weight through a rolled ankle. So that ability to sense where you are in space is really important for preventing injury. And then we also know that glute muscles should be strong. And then if you have some stiffness in your ankles, same thing, maybe try to work some of that stiffness out. And really always incorporating that principle of progressively starting your activity. And then when you're addressing your mental risk factors, if you've lost any confidence in outdoors and you're not feeling confident in your ability, I always like to mention to people that working with a mental health professional is for sports. It's not just for professional athletes. You can access someone to help you with this. And when it comes to your mental health being impacted by injury, that's a big one that physiotherapists can help with. So say you injure yourself and it just feels maybe like a tweak or a mild strain and you don't really want to take time off for it because you don't want your mental health to suffer. What we know is that early involvement of physiotherapy decreases your overall length of injury and your feeling of pain and impairment. So addressing it quickly and early is really important. And that might not mean that your physiotherapist tells you, okay, you need to stop hiking completely. Maybe you just don't go as long or on as difficult of terrain for a while, and you're still able to get out in a meaningful way. And then always consider both types of fatigue, mental and physical, and just trying to have room in your conversations about ego. When we're looking at the environmental risk factors, obviously whether is not always something that we can plan around. 
But if you know it's going to be really poor weather for the hike you're choosing to do, maybe consider changing your plans based on that. And then consider terrain. So if you know there's a lot of scree and downhill terrain, know that's where people tend to injure themselves more. And maybe plan a shorter day where you're going to be less fatigued, maybe have more nutrition, just make sure that you cover your bases a bit more. And some types of terrain might be more challenging for you specifically. So just keeping that in mind if you can. And then if you have a lower base pack weight, you know you're lowering your incident or your risk of nerve related issues. And then when you're choosing your footwear, make sure it's well fitting. You try to have dry socks as much as possible. Make sure it's maintained so replace it when you need to. And consider type so we know that type of footwear will impact type of injuries. And then we'll dive in more to hiking poles and itinerary. So for blisters, this is a little bit of a more note on footwear. So we know from those, the study done in Spain that you want to control humidity and that walking on dirt, grass, and gravel is better. Asphalt is worse. But they also found that people who wore foot orthoses were less likely to get blisters. So for example, this is my foot orthotic I wore when I was on the Great Divide Trail. So this, this has seen a thousand kilometers of hiking. It's a little bit falling apart now, but you can see it's really thin, it's minimal, which is what I wanted in order to fit into these really small hiking shoes. But it has this arch support here. And having arch support that fits for your specific arch can prevent your incidence of getting blisters, but it can also prevent foot fatigue. So this is something that I noticed when I was talking with other hikers, other through hikers. We were a few, I think we were almost 500 kilometers in, at least 400 kilometers in, and they were asking how my foot fatigue was because theirs still hadn't gone away. And I said, actually, I haven't really noticed any foot fatigue. And I realized and talking over dinner with them that they were using just the insoles that came with the shoe. So when you buy a hiking boot or a shoe, it just comes with a thin insole and they're not very supportive at all. So you don't necessarily need to actually get a specific foot orthotic made for you, but there are really great over the counter ones that you can buy that you can get to fit your arch pretty well. And that's much better than the ones that come just with the shoe. So the pros and cons of hiking poles are really interesting. So the cons are, like I mentioned earlier, it might increase your risk of having an ankle sprain if you use hiking poles. And we think that if you put weight through your arms, that should probably take some weight away from your legs. But what research in laboratory settings has shown is that that actually doesn't decrease the weight that you're putting through your legs. But there are pros as well. So what hikers report who use poles is that they feel less delayed onset muscle soreness if they use poles. So you know if your legs or your body feels sore from an exercise like a day, two, three, four days later. If you use hiking poles, you're less likely to feel that in your legs or it'll be less severe. And you know if you hike and you kind of feel that jello in your legs, like super weak feeling, if you use hiking poles, you'll also feel less of that loss of strength. But there's other pros that I see as well, like being able to keep your balance a little bit better on certain technical terrain or being able to pitch your tent with the hiking poles instead of tent poles if you're trying to lighten your pack weight. So therefore, you're actually decreasing your risk of nerve injury, um, maybe using it as an emergency splint if you need. So there are many different uses for hiking poles. Okay, so let's talk about itinerary because itinerary planning is important not only for the year. So if we're looking ahead at your hiking season, say you're going to hike from like June to September, we want to plan a slow start to your itinerary over the course of the season, but also over the course of a specific hike. So if you have a longer hike in mind, which most of you did in the poll, if you're thinking I want to do my first two week hike. It's important to consider your itinerary as you start that hike. So actually trying to start with a slower start than what you know you're able to do to ease your body into the hike. So what you need to do is you need to calculate your comfortable hiking pace. So look back on hikes you've done before and determine what pace you find most comfortable or that you find your body is able to do pretty well. And then you might need to change that depending on the terrain. So if it's alpine terrain with lots of elevation gain, that's probably going to be different than if it was flatter terrain. 
And then based on that, plan a slower start. And on certain days, you might want to shorten your days based on the terrain or based on how fatigued you think you might be. And if you can schedule and rest days, that's really good for your body. So if you did a two-week hike, for example, you might want to schedule one half day or one super short day partway through or even a whole rest day. It's ideal to schedule in one rest day per week of being out there. Let's dive into that a little bit further. So this is how I calculated my pace for the Great Divide Trail. So I took the total number of kilometers I was going to hike, and then I divided that by the average kilometers I wanted to hike per day. So I took that average pace that I knew I was comfortable doing, which was about 25 kilometers in eight hours. And then I added the number of rest days I would need, which was one rest day per section, because each section was about a week. And that gave me my total number of days I should plan for. So I I took that comfortable hiking pace, which was 25 kilometers in eight hours, and I thought, okay, I'm going to plan to do 20 to 30 kilometers per day. So my first week of my hike, I actually only hiked 15 kilometers, then 15, then 22, then 20, then 20. And I didn't hike as fast as I could. I took my time, I took breaks, I rested in the shade, and I really tried to ease my body into it. And then I had a rest day. And then it wasn't until the next week that I started doing my average pace. So I would strongly recommend this if you're planning a longer hike, but I also took these principles into account when I was training for my hike. So in June, I did a 10 day hike on the Sunshine Coast Trail on the West Coast of BC. And I didn't plan any of my days to be longer than 20K on that hike. And I planned some pretty short days, about 10K. And that was really to ease my body into backpacking again. It was my only my second backpacking trip of the year and test out my gear and test out how my body did with my backpack. And if you want to read all about this and download my itinerary and get my Excel spreadsheet, so you can go to millennialmountaineer.com forward slash blog and you can read my how to plan for a great divide trail through hike blog, all about permits and itinerary and everything. So maybe take a picture of this or screenshot it. If I haven't drilled this home enough yet, you really want to focus on slowly introducing your body to every activity. This isn't just hiking, this is every activity to dramatically decrease your risk of injury. So just ease your way into it. Take your time. Go slower than you think you need to. Now, even if you've done your best to address risk factors, injuries still happen and it's okay, we got you. Try to contact your physiotherapist as soon as you can. And that's really important because early physiotherapy is associated with decreased overall length of injury, pain, and impairment. So as soon as possible, contact your physiotherapist. Um, At Karen Physiotherapy, we are developing an option for if you do have an inReach or a satellite device, you can send us a message and try to schedule a last-minute physiotherapy appointment, Um, especially if you're trying for a longer hike and maybe you have one rest day trying to fit in an online physio session in that rest day so we can assess if it's safe and worth for you to keep pushing. Maybe there's just a few little tips and tricks we need to give you or if our advice is actually to pause, rest, and then try again um, maybe in a few weeks. I always like to just note that rest is most important after an injury in the first two weeks. And then it's really important to start progressively reusing your body, moving your body, getting it ready to go back to the sport or activity you want to do. And um, I see a lot of re-injuries when people rest, you know, they say, I rested for a month and then I thought I'm fine, I, I feel fine, and go back into the sport they were doing because they didn't actually progressively get their body used to it. So their body was actually at a higher risk of re-injury. So we've already touched on a lot about how to prepare your body for hiking. So um, you address all your risk factors for injury. Try to start planning early. So four months in, or six months in advance, which it's January now, so perfect timing. Try to work with a physiotherapist to help determine your individual physical needs. And then if you plan your itinerary for the season early, and it doesn't need to be specific, but a rough itinerary, plan that early and plan your gear early so you can actually start training towards your goal in your itinerary, slowly building your body up, 
practicing. So choose your footwear that you want to wear, choose the backpack you want to use and start slowly practicing with a little bit more and a little bit more weight in your bag. And then make an injury plan. So if you do get injured, have a plan, have a physiotherapist you can trust that you can contact. So preventative physiotherapy helps address injury, but it also helps boost your performance. So if we're addressing muscular imbalances or movement patterns, that can improve how well you're using your body, optimize how you're using it in a more efficient way, and improve your hiking technique in general. So you can go faster, longer, and reach your goals better. We don't have specific research studies on hiking and performance, but a recent study um, we found was done on surfing athletes who did a preventative physiotherapy program, and that was to prevent injuries, but they also reported 75% of those athletes had a boost in their performance, which is super exciting. So feel free to take a picture or screenshot of this slide if you'd like. So based on all the general evidence and what we know Footwear choices should be done with keeping in mind that you want to try to control moisture, maybe consider foot orthoses to support your arch. And we know that hiking boots are worse for nerve pain and sandals are worse for fractures. Hiking poles help with muscle soreness and weakness, but they might increase your risk of ankle sprain. Pack weight helps lower your in, um, a lower pack weight lowers your risk of nerve related injury. Physiotherapy decreases your risk of musculoskeletal injury and high impact injury and boosts your performance. And when you're planning your itinerary, plan a slow start. And when you're planning, also consider terrain. Scree and downhill is where people tend to injure themselves the most. So I just wanted to let you know about our hiking prep program. So this program I designed with my teammates at Karen Physiotherapy, and it was really to address this issue of helping people identify their individual risk factors create a program to address them, prevent re-injury, prevent injuries, and then prepare you for your hiking goal over the next six months. So you can pay per session, just like physiotherapy. It's all online and we offer tons of resources for you and handouts. So I'll pop my email in the chat if you're interested in learning more. Thank you so much for joining. It was awesome to see everyone here. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and happy hiking. Bye.